Okay. Oh, see, one second. Okay, uh, let's get started. So welcome back to CS4 79, machine learning for 3D data. Um, before we get started, we talk about the announcement. So I guess everyone submitted uh, the solution the assignment one. So how was the assignment one? Uh, do you have any comments and feedback for the assignment one? Was it okay? Was it too easy, too difficult? Any comments for the assignment one? Yeah, so now you won't be able to send a message to the everyone. So please send the message to me. Uh, do you have any comments for the assignment one? Any comments? Okay. Was it too easy or too difficult? Any issues with the K Cloud? Yeah. So obviously the assignment one should be the easiest the assignment. Uh, but there might be some kind of the some technical issues instead of like uh in terms of like you know installing some libraries and basically handling some things in the K Cloud. Uh so also for the assignment two and the three, you would need to basically install some libraries or something. Uh so please uh start uh the other the assignments uh as early as possible. And also you can, it's now also time to start the assignment two. So the assignment two will be about the neural rendering that we are going to discuss in the uh, couple of the weeks, today, this week and the next week. Uh, so please uh, start that uh, for now and see uh, how it goes. And one the assignment, the, uh, one the announcement is that uh, we are going to have a guest lecture. So we are basically supposed to be two guest lectures, one before the midterm and one after the midterm. Uh, so right before the midterm week, obviously we don't have the midterm, but before the midterm week, uh, we're going to have a guest lecture by Niloy Mitra, uh, who is a professor at the University College London. Uh, so he's visiting KAIST, so there'll be also the great chance that we can also uh, have some kind of a chance to uh, see him in person. And the thing is that he won't be able to give the lecture in our day regular slot. So the plan for now is that we are going to have He's the guest lecture on the October 10th, we will be, which will be Tuesday, 4 p.m. So I'm going to make this as kind of some hybrid uh, the lecture uh, so that the online people can also join. Uh, but for the people uh, basically staying in this campus, please uh, join this lecture uh, offline. Uh, so I'm also going to announce the location soon. Uh, so that's kind of one thing. And also, uh, if you uh you know if you check the, the old schedule basically also we have the deadline for the project proposal uh so please also check out all the schedule for the project as well so the plan for now is that uh you need to basically submit a the project proposal uh for each team and after that there will be some kind of the the mock-up uh kind of the, the process so you also need to uh submit the results of your the mock-up of your the project and also after that you need to also uh, provide to need to do some kind of the project pitch, uh, which will be some kind of the very short uh, video presentation. Uh, so the deadline for the project the proposal is this coming Sunday, September 21st. And the thing is that you will need to basically uh, submit a write up with all the information for the project. And also the idea is that you will just need to edit your submission in the open review. So if you now go back to the open review for each of the team, uh, you will be able to see the kind of the, the one, the item uh, for the project proposal. So you will need to basically edit your submission uh, by just adding your the write up for the project proposal. So all the details are also explained in the, the course web page. Uh, so please check out uh, all the details. Uh, so yeah, uh, you know, all the details basically there. Any questions for the project proposal? Uh, if you also have any questions uh, for the project proposal, I also recommend you to uh, come to the office hour. So we're going to also have the office hour uh, tonight at the 7 p.m. in the N1 building. So please uh, join us and also you can ask some questions to me or our PAs in Slack. And also we slightly change the policy for the quizzes. So basically the thing is that you will be able to also check out the participation discourse that our TA is basically grading. Uh, so our TA basically shared the link 
uh, of the participation in this course. So please check it out. And if you have any questions for that, please also send a message to me or the TA uh, in Slack. And also from today, uh, you won't be able to send a message to the, uh, the public. So please send a message to me uh, in the, the Zoom for all the quizzes. Any questions on this? Yeah, so, so far, basically, we discussed some kind of the neural net architectures that can process the point cloud as the input. So you want questions to any other office hours in this week? Uh, well, I mean, we are not planning to have some other the office hours this week, but if you cannot join the office hour today, uh, feel free to send a message to me or the TAs, then we will be able to basically uh, schedule some time for the chat uh, for the office hours. Okay, any other questions for the office hours or some other things? Okay, moving on. Uh, so, so far, basically, uh, we discussed some kind of neural network detectors that can process the point cloud data, especially as the inputs. So we are basically making some kind of encoder. And last time, we also briefly discussed some ideas then how we can also make the decoder with some kind of the loss functions for the reconstruction, right? So actually, we skipped some of these slides in the previous lectures, but actually there are some kind of the three different ideas in terms of defining some loss function uh, for the reconstruction. Uh, have you checked the slides in the previous lectures? What, what are the three the loss functions in the slides? Uh, this is the first question. Yeah, so I, I recommend you to basically check out the uh, slides in the previous lecture that basically include all the information about the loss functions that we skipped a little bit. Uh, basically, also the, uh, yeah, so I was asking the loss function for the decoder, not the uh, decoding architecture. Yeah, so please check out. Uh, so the assignment one was about uh, implementing the autoencoder with the chamfer distance, uh, but you could also use the Earthmos distance as the loss function. And also, it's not that good idea to use the Hausdorff distance because it's very slow if you use that uh, uh, for the training the neural net. Uh, but basically, yeah, that can be used for some kind of evaluation of the reconstruction the quality. So we discussed basically the three ideas for the, the loss functions. Uh, so please check them out uh, in the, the lecture slides in the previous lecture. So those are basically very simple the idea. Basically, if we make some kind of the autoencoder that can basically compress some kind of the, a set of the 3D shapes into some kind of the latent course, uh, some kind of the middle layer here. And then we, what we can do is that we can basically use some kind of, for example, like some point net uh, or any kind of the variant of the point net as the encoder, and then just make some kind of the simple the NLP uh, to basically predict a set of the points as the output. So that would be very simple, the idea that we can make some kind of the, any kind of the um, encoder, the autoencoder of the, the point cloud. And also we can make some, any kind of architecture that can take some, any data, the modality as the input. So we can basically make some kind of architecture like image to 3D, taking the image as the input and generating the point cloud as the output. by right? just so basically having the encoder for the images and the decoder for the point clouds and that can be actually anything like text to 3D is possible that we can make some kind of the text encoder and the point cloud encoder, basically training will be neural net with some kind of the pairs, given pairs of the input and the output and with some kind of the reconstructed loss. So that would be very straightforward idea in terms of like making uh, any kind of the encoding, the decoding the architectures. So these are also some kind of the examples that we are just taking these uh, images as the input and basically making some kind of the point cloud as the output for those kind of the cases. So it sounds like we can do any kind of 3D construction for now, right? But what are we kind of limitations if we use this kind of the decoder for the point cloud? So if we make a neural net that can basically produce a point cloud as the output, uh, what are the kind of the downside in this kind of the case? Uh, we also did some, discussed some kind of the pros and the cons of the different representations, the 3D data. Uh, but you know, if we just recall all these things, uh, what are the kind of the downside of the, uh, the limitations, the point cloud decoders? Yeah, 
requires lots of the points to get some all the fine details, no geometry information, uh, taking lots of the memory. Yeah, so those are kind of some of the limitations, right? So obviously what we discussed last time is that obviously, you know, for the point cloud, if we want to capture all the fine details in the geometry, then we might basically need to have some tones of the points uh, to basically you know, describing all the details. But the thing is that uh, if we basically make a neural net that basically produces like, you know, for example, like hundreds or th thousands of the points as the output, uh, then actually it will take lots of the time and also lots of the GPU memory uh, in terms of like making some kind of the giant the neural net. Uh, so that's basically very inefficient kind of architecture, uh, making some kind of the point cloud as the output. And also one kind of some the, the downside for this kind of the architecture is that uh, it's not possible to, to basically change the number of the points, which means that if we make a neural net architecture, for example, that produces like 1,000 or 2,000 points as the output, uh, then you know, once you train the neural net with the architecture produce, for example, like 2,000 points as the output, then you cannot basically produce like, for example, like 3,000, the more number of the points, because the network was basically trained to just produce the exact uh, the 20 to 2,000 kind of the points. So we can also change the basically resolution of the output. So that's kind of the one, the downside of this kind of the, the, the point cloud decoder. And also the, the downside uh, that we also discussed last time is that uh, typically uh, for many kinds of the application, we first need to basically convert all the point cloud into the other representation. That, that will basically involve the process that we are basically converting this point cloud into the input function and convert it back to the meshes or the other the representations. So in terms of all the things, actually the point cloud decoder is very inefficient the system uh, that we cannot capture all the fine details and also that it also requires some kind of conversion uh, to be used in the final V applications. Make sense? So the main topic that we are going to discuss for today is basically some of the architectures that can produce the implicit function as the output. Uh, so we also discussed the idea of the implicit representation, basically having a function that actually representing the shape uh, as the kind of the, uh, some kind of output. And the, the topic that we are going to discuss for today is, is basically how we basically build a neural network that can generate not a point cloud as the output, but actually a implicit function as the output. So that's the, the basic idea. So if we go over with this simple idea, uh, the first question that we're gonna have is that basically, how are we gonna basically utilize the neural net as kind of the representation of the implicit function? So basically implicit function is basically a function and we can also use the neural net as kind of that function that basically takes the 3D coordinates as the input and then basically you know, uh, predicting either some kind of values for each of the point. Then we can basically consider basically having a neural net as kind of the input function that describes a basically shape. Does it make sense? So basically given any kind of a single D object, we can basically consider representing that shape using a neural network, which is basically taking any arbitrary the point, the position of the, uh, you know, the coordinates of the point in the 2D or the 3D space, and basically outputting some kind of the values. So the value can be either some assigned distance or the occupancy the value. So this will be basically the case that we are basically training our the neural net. So in a way that the, net, the network becomes the input function described as 3D shape. Make sense? So that's basically a pretty simple idea. So we can, basically we can think about how we're gonna basically uh, make such kind of neural net by training. So we basically might need to basically provide some kind of training data uh, to the neural net uh, to train basically this kind of the network in a way that the network can basically precisely describe the shape that we have. Uh, so the first question is that we can consider the two, actually the multiple the types of the values as the output. So we can either consider basically predicting the signed distance as the output from the you know, x, y, z coordinates, or we can basically consider some kind of occupancy function. So as we discussed last time, the signed distance was basically the idea that for each of the points in the either 2D or the 3D space, we are basically encoding the distance uh, from the surface the boundary of the shape uh, to that point, but we are basically giving some kind of a sign as well. So if the point is inside, we can give the minus sign, or if the point is the outside, then we can give the plus sign, or we can flip the sign as well, right? So that is the basic idea for the signed distance function. 
Well, the other way around might be that we can basically simply uh, basically provide some kind of the occupancy values in terms of the if the points are basically inside, we give the one, where the points are the outside when we give the zero, or the other way around as well, right? And here also the quick question is that for each of the cases, uh, if we have this kind of the, you know, either sign distance function or the occupancy key function, then how we can also extract the, the boundary information? Uh, what will be basically the points that are basically on the boundary of the, the shape, or basically on the surface of the shape? Uh, for each of the case of the sign distance function and the occupancy function, uh, what are the basically the points that are basically on the boundary of the, the surface of the shapes? You could just recall the things that we discussed last time. So the question was basically, what would the, for each of the cases, what are the points that are basically on the, the surface of the shapes? Yeah, I mean, for the sine distance function, obviously the zero as I said, uh, basically the points where the sine distance function, the value becomes zero, uh, are basically the points uh, over the surface, right? So basically we can just need to find the points where the, uh, you know, the value, the sign of distance value becomes zero for the points. Then the problem might be that for the occupancy function, uh, what would be the, basically the points uh, that are basically on the, the boundary, the, 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 the surface of the shapes? Yeah, it depends on what we do. Uh, but typically what we can do is that since we assign one to the inside and zero to the outside, if we think about like giving some kind of the continuous values for all the points, then we can consider that uh, the points that are having the 0 0.5 as kind of the points on the surface, right? So, but that might not be the, the, the precise way, but it can be kind of the one way that we can uh, do in terms of like extracting the surface information for these shapes. So basically we discussed the idea, basically given this kind of the input function, how we can convert this into the voxels and also the meshes using the, the March cube, the ideas. Uh, then also the question might be is that, uh, what will be basically the loss function that we can use for each of the cases? So let's think about these two cases. We are basically having a you know, given the sign distance function and also the other, the occupancy function. Then how we can define the loss function uh, for those kind of cases? So this is basically the cases that we are having the pairs, uh, the, the input and the output. So for each of the points, we know the exact, the ground truth, uh, the sign distance value or the occupancy value. Uh, and then how we can basically train the neural net so that the neural net becomes the input function, right? Yeah, I'm just asking, very simple the questions. Uh, obviously, these are very uh, you know simple things, but just checking whether you have some basic knowledge in the deep learning. So yeah, if you have some very basic knowledge in the deep learning, then obviously like something we can do is, is that you know, for the sign this function, we can use some kind of the regression the losses like L1 and the L2 losses. Uh, for the occupancy function, well, I mean, we can basically, this will be the case that we are having the zero or the one, the binary, the values. Then instead of like using the regression the values, actually we can use some kind of the, the binary the cross entropy loss, uh, which will be more effective in terms of like uh, learning with this kind of the binary the values. Right? Then let's think about some kind of real case. So we are having a kind of the three D shape that can be represented into the any form, uh, and then we are basically want to uh, wanting to basically learn uh, train a neural net uh, that basically becomes the implicit function of the same shape then how we can basically provide some kind of training data uh, into the neural net, right? So that's basically what we want to do. So given any kind of 3D shape, uh, we want to train a neural net in a way that the neural net actually becomes a input function, right? Uh, for that, how we can basically uh, provide the training data uh, to the, the neural network? Uh, another question. Yeah, obviously we will need to sample, random sample the points. Um, uh, 
But for to all the randomly sampled the points, we will also need to have the, the correct answer, the ground truth of the sign distance value or the octopus value, right? So that basically means that given any kind of 3D shape, uh, we will need to basically first convert the given shape into a implicit function first and provide the, all the values, the sign distance value or the occupancy, and then train the neural net, right? Makes sense. Then also, then the question might be is that, then this basically means that we already have the implicit function, then what's the point of training the neural net? So that would be the, basically the question that we can ask. Like, you know, if you want to train a neural net that becomes the implicit function of the point cloud or the, any kind of 3D shape, then you first need to have the implicit function to provide some kind of training data. Then what's the point? Why do we need to basically make the neural net of like, you know, uh, making the same implicit function, right? Uh, so compared to the, the other the ideas that we discussed in terms of like making the implicit function, so we discussed some ideas basically just finding the closest points to measure the some distance where the moving least squares uh, or radius basis function or the Poisson surface reconstruction, uh, basically making, converting the point clouds into the implicit function, where actually there are some other the direct way to basically convert the meshes into the implicit function, but whatever. Uh, so given this kind of some approaches that we can take uh, in terms of making the implicit function, uh, what would be the advantage if we train a neural net to make the neural net Neural implicit function. Yeah, we can compress the data. We can get the implicit function with unknown objects. Uh, yeah, we can get the values for the uh, not in the samples. Well, actually, we, we are already having some implicit function where we can basically get some values for any points, right? So actually, we will get to that. Actually, one of the advantages, uh, as you also some of you mentioned, that we can also achieve this, some generalization to the other three shapes. But even before that, actually, the good thing is that we can make some very compact representation uh, of the implicit function. So in the case of like just converting the point cloud also the meshes into the implicit function would be is that we still need to have the point cloud or the mesh to compute the all the values for the any kind of arbitrary points uh, for the implicit function. Uh, but using by, by using a neural network, we can make some very compact uh, the representation of the implicit function. Basically, by just having a simple DNLP, uh, they can just encode all these kind of design distance for the occupancy information uh, using some very compact uh, this small the MLP. So in terms of compressing the 3D the shape information, that can be really good. Uh, so that's kind of like one advantage. Also, one important thing is that uh, if we want to basically have this kind of the implicit representation, as you can see, these are all the representation basically describing a volume, right? So for the cases that when we do not have any kind of the volume information, but some kind of the some surface or something, or even when you have some kind of the a volume like the shape, if we have some kind of small hole, uh, so that basically uh, makes some kind of difficulty basically this describing uh, you know, discriminating the inside and the outside region, uh, then we, we cannot use this kind of some implicit representation uh, because those are all the representation describing a volume. Uh, so that's all the very important things. So if you basically uh, make some kind of this kind of decoder that basically generate the, all the 3D shapes as the volume, uh, you first need to have some kind of the water type shape. Basically the water type shape basically means that a shape that basically describes a volume that can basically decode the inside and the outside of the space. Uh, so basically even when you have some kind of spill like the shape, if you have like small hole uh, on the surface so that we cannot basically uh, decide whether the points is, is the inside or the outside, then we cannot use this kind of the architectures in terms like uh, describing some volume information. So for any kind of the uh, the cases when you want to basically learn some kind of the input representation of the 3D shapes, uh, you first need to have some kind of volume information, which means that you need to uh, first have some kind of the water tight the mesh or some water tight shape information uh, that has some clear the boundaries of the inside and the outside region. Uh, so that's kind of one thing. Uh, is it possible for the neural net to accurately represent the input function for any 3D shape? Uh, yes. Yeah, so that the, the question for this is basically that the, the shape needs to be basically worked at. Uh, any other questions? 
Okay, so moving on. So yeah, basically we need to have some kind of the, some conversion from the any representation then the other to the implicit function. And also the thing is that uh, for training this kind of the neural net uh, that becomes the implicit function, actually the, the sampling is quite important because basically we are much more you know, interested in some kind of region in the 2D or the 3D space uh, that are basically containing the surface, the boundary of the shapes, right? So basically what we can do in terms of like improving the accuracy uh, of the like describing all the details with 3D shape is that uh, we can sample the points more uh, near the surface. So basically one simple kind of some trick in terms of like training this kind of neural net is that we are sampling more points over the surface of the 3D shapes and perturbing all the points a little bit, in, like adding some kind of noise, as you can see in some kind of the uh, some red points uh, on the, the right hand side here, in a way that we are basically having some more the points, doing some kind of the important sampling, basically having some more points near the surface. But if you only take these some these samples near the surface, then you are basically also overfitting uh, to these specific regions. Then we don't know what sort of the random errors we're gonna get for some kind of the other the rest of the area. So what we can do is that we can sample more near the surface. Basically, we can, for example, like take the 90% of the points near the surface and basically you know, get some kind of the information there while still basically taking some uniform sampling over the entire the space uh, for the 10% of the points. Then we can basically focus more on some kind of like getting some fine detail information near the, 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 the surface uh, of the shapes. So this is basically the basic idea in terms of like training a neural net for a single the object, right? And the question is that actually we want to make some kind of the a 3D shape decoder that can basically produce not only a single shape, but actually, but also can some multiple shapes as well, right? Uh, which means that we want to basically neural net that can uh, basically, that can basically decode uh, basically the multiple 3D shapes. Then the idea is that the question is that how we can extend this kind of neural net uh, in a way that they can basically decode some kind of multiple shapes. Uh, so one question is the, how do we know which point is on the surface? Well, I mean, in the case that when you have some given input 3D shape, but when, as I mentioned in the previous slides, oh, this will be basically the case that we are basically uh, somehow, you know, representing a the given 3D shape using kind of neural net, then we will know like, you know, the only the shape information, right? Uh, so basically we can uh, sample more uh, over the near the surface of the, the, the shape uh, in this space and still we can have some kind of uniform samples in the entire space. Is it the bounding box annotated automatically? I mean, we can calculate the bounding box our, ourselves. Yeah, it's not the crucial part. I mean, we, we can basically decide some kind of region that we want to basically sample the points and in, in, in that entire space, we can still take some kind of the 10% of the uniform samples uh, while focusing more on the near the surface of the sheet. And also the question is that, you know, how are we gonna basically extend this kind of neural net in a way that they can basically encode in multiple shapes, right? So actually there are some kind of the couple of the ideas for that, I mean, we'll simple the ideas. Obviously the other simple the idea is that we can basically combine this kind of decoder with the encoder so basically we are having some kind of the encoder here. They can take some either kind of the point cloud. Uh, if we want to make some kind of the auto encoder, then we can basically uh, make some kind of 3D shape uh, encoder, uh, either taking point cloud, whatever kind of things as the input. And then you know, we are basically getting some kind of the feature vector or some kind of the latent code uh, for each of the input. And then we are feeding this kind of the extra the shape information as the some you know, additional the input uh, to the neural net. Uh, in a way that we can basically take some kind of the, the shape information here and also the x, y, z coordinates as kind of the combined the input so that we can either predict the sign distance value or the optical function. So using this kind of very simple the architecture, basically having some kind of the multiple the linear layers in the NLP, uh, we can simply basically make some kind of the neural network that can basically decode the multiple shapes. Right? Actually, the other way around is that uh, we can actually consider having some kind of the sort of the meta function. So when you basically have this kind of the neural net, uh, which is basically taking the x, y, z coordinates and then basically you know, predicting some kind of the uh, either sign distance function or the occupancy values, uh, we can basically create, uh, have some kind of the another the neural network, uh, which is basically given any kind of input, uh, this network is actually predicting the set of the parameters of this network. 
Uh, so it's basically predicting the parameters of the implicit function uh, of a 3D shape. So given any kind of the, either the input image or input 3D shape, uh, whatever kind of things, uh, we are basically predicting a set of the parameters uh, of the another the neural network, uh, which becomes the implicit function uh, of the output the shapes. So that's basically the case that we are having some kind of the so-called the meta function uh, that predicts the parameters of the other function. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, so this is also some kind of uh, well-known kind of the cases that we can see in multiple the applications that we are basically having a neural network to predict the parameters of the other neural network. Uh, what is the loss function for the meta function then? Well, maybe we can use the same the reconstruction to the loss. So this will be also the case that we are having, for example, like image as the input, right? And some kind of the 3D shape as the output, right? So this will be input and 3D shape as the output, right? Oh, sorry. Oh, my God. Yeah. Image in and the 3D output, right? And for each of the 3D shapes, so we're going to have a some kind of the, the point, right? And some arbitrary the points that we sampled in the space. And for those kind of the points, we're going to have some kind of the, either the occupancy value uh, or some sign distance value, right? Then what we can do is that we can, we are basically feeding this input image as the input here. And this network basically predicts the parameters of the other linear network here. That becomes the parameters here. And given the 3D coordinates, we are basically predicting either the sign the distance value or the occupancy uh, the value. And then we are basically uh, training the entire the network with the loss function here. So that's the simple idea. Can the number of the input function change? Number of the input function? Well, I mean, you mean the number of the 3D shapes? Yeah, obviously, we, we do not need to specify the number of the 3D shapes here. So as you also implemented the point cloud the autoencoder in the assignment one, we can take any number of the pairs in this case. So it's matter of like how much this neural net has the capacity in terms of like you know memorizing the input and the output the pairs. So we can train the whole the network with the set of the input, the pairs of the input and the output. So the input and the output can be either images and the three D or text to three D, whatever three D to three D, whatever kind of things, and then training the this network. Uh, basically having this kind of the meta the network. Any questions on this? Yeah, very simple the idea. Uh, so actually, as I said, like the good thing of like having this kind of the architecture, especially compared to the other some decoding the architectures, is that as you can see here, uh, the really good thing is that uh, the 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 network the parameter size can be very small. As you can see in the previous slide, uh, here, I mean, even with this kind of like simple the NLP the network, actually this simple the decoding architecture uh, basically can decode some multiple shapes. So in terms of that, you know, even with some very the compact the architecture of the neural net, uh, we can basically encode and decode some multiple three D shapes. So that's really kind of the big advantage of this kind of the implicit representation. But as you can see, uh, can you see the, the downside, the limitation of the, uh, the implicit the decoder? The problem is that it takes like tons of time uh, for the inference. Uh, any questions? Uh, is there someone who is like sending a message to me? I think I'm missing some of the messages. Yeah, let me... Move on. Uh, let me know if you are sending some. What's the difference the models between the making another model that could just be used? Uh, block directly. I mean, these are two different ways of designing the decoders. Like actually, those two might make some kind of some small difference in terms of the performance at the end. Uh, but typically, uh, you know, whatever you use some kind of the previous idea or the second the the first idea or the second the idea. Uh, that are not making some big difference in the outputs, just like different ways to basically uh, make some big decoder. What does the discretization mean in the table? Well, I mean, so these are, especially these two are basically the cases, like having some decoder that basically uh, decoding uh, the voxels. 
basically predicting either the occupancy values or some kind of values uh, for each of the voxels. So the output is always the some values for each of the voxel uh, with this resolution. Uh, so it's really kind of uh, having some troubles in terms of that we cannot also change the resolution of the output. It's the same limitation of the point cloud decoder. Uh, so those two architectures are already specifically predicting, generating uh, the 3D shapes into this resolution. And the Atlas Net, uh, let me briefly show the Atlas Net. Atlas Net is also the case that we are basically describing a 3D shape as kind of a set of the 2D patches. So now, as you can see in this example, you know, basically describing the 3D shape uh, as kind of some kind of the stitching of the only 2D D patches. Uh, so that is also kind of having some kind of the limitations in terms of the resolution. So basically, if you train the network with the to produce the 25D patches, then we cannot uh, basically increase the number of the patches. So having some kind of similar the resolution uh, issues. Uh, but the good thing of the uh, the network uh, that basically produce the increase function is that uh, we don't need to have any we don't have any kind of limitation restriction uh, in terms of the resolution of the output. So in the test time, in the at the inference time, we can basically uh, sample the points in this space as many as we want, and for all the points, we can basically get some kind of values. So we are not basically restricting the resolution of the output. So that's kind of the one big advantage of the implicit decoder. But as you can see, the downside is that these are also the cases that we are basically getting some kind of the per the point, uh, the values, right? So basically, at the, the inference time, we, we also need to sample lots of the points in the, the space and get some kind of the either the, some values, right? Uh, so this will basically take lots of the time because for the other linear network, those will be the cases that are basically generating the 3D shape uh, with the one single you know, single time kind of inference. Uh, but the, the input decoder will be the case that you know, we are basically uh, getting some of the values uh, for each of the points, uh, for the points that we sampled in the space. So basically the inference takes like way more time compared to the other linear network that directly basically uh, generate all the values uh, for the given the points or the voxels. So that's basically pros and the cons. So the implicit decoder can be some very compact, uh, some kind of the, the neural net models that can produce the 3D shapes, uh, but basically it will take some very longer time, way longer time uh, the test time uh, to produce a single discrete object. So it's kind of basically the pros and the cons of the implicit decoder. Does it make sense? So is that why the inference time is so slow for the... Uh, yes, uh, not only for the sampling, but also you need to uh, uh, get the values for each of the samples, right? So which means that you need to run the, uh, the fourth pass of the neural net uh, multiple times uh, for all the samples that you have. But the other architectures would be the case that they are basically predict, you know, predicting, generating these 3D shapes with a single time the inference, right? One time the fourth pass. Does it make sense? I also mentioned the deep meta functionals paper. They, there was a parameter called uh, scale that we were predicting uh, with I this. Can I hear you well? Uh, can you speak? Uh, can can you hear me? Uh, I guess I need to increase the volume. Uh, yeah, this is, is it, the my maximum volume. Can you speak a little bit loudly? Is it is it okay now? Uh, yeah. Okay, so I had a question on the deep meta functionals paper. Um, there was a parameter that we predicted with this auxiliary network called that's scale. The parameter for what? I say. The sound is not clear to me. Is is it better now or not? Yeah, it's better. Okay, so um, could you please elaborate on the scale parameter on the deep meta functionals on this paper called deep meta functionals? I think it was on your previous slide. Here. Yeah, there was a there, there was a parameter called scale. This uh, red box. Scale. Scale. Yeah, it's one of the parameters that is that is uh, predicted by the. By network G. I see. F, by network F. Well, yeah, I, I don't know what the, the scale parameters there. Yeah. 
Okay. But basically, this will be so just be some simple D cases that you are having some simple D MLP uh, uh, in the second network, and then you are predicting the all the parameters for the second network. Yeah, I got this part that like um, we're predicting weight bias, and then there's this third one, which I, I don't have any idea what it could be. Yeah, you, you can check these details. Yeah, I think this is not that important detail. Okay. Yeah, so any other questions? So yeah, basically we are talking about that you know, the input decoder can be good uh, in terms of like basically making some very compact uh, the architectures for the decoding, uh, but taking way longer time for the, at the inference time. Uh, and also, yeah, as I said, also the good thing is that you know, it does not basically restrict the resolution of the output. So basically in the test time, uh, we can basically uh, produce 3D sheets uh, with any randomly you know, resolution as you want. But as you can see, for the cases that we are decoding the 3D boxes as the output, uh, so if you basically train the neural net with some certain resolution, that you cannot change the resolution uh, in the output. So that's also kind of the downside of this kind of the approach. And also, while it would be possible to represent a 3D shape as kind of a set of the patches uh, in this kind of the case, basically having some kind of the, uh, some stitching of the old 2D patches, uh, for those kind of the cases, the kind of the problem is that uh, it's also hard to basically produce 3D shapes with some, with some kind of the arbitrary the topology of the 3D shapes. Having all the holes uh, the, on the back side of the chairs. Uh, and also this might be the same issue for the point cloud or the meshes as well, uh, especially for the cases like predicting some, uh, generating the point cloud. Uh, if you have any kind of a set of the points on the back side uh, in this kind of a case, uh, it would be really hard to determine uh, what the kind of the some points that should be connected to each other, right? So basically not giving any kind of the, just some topology the information, uh, but also the good thing of the input decoder is that they can be more the flexible in terms of like producing any 3D shapes with the, any arbitrary the topology with also uh, the capability of like describing all the some geometric the details. So as you can see, uh, the input decoder can uh, we better basically you know, you know, uh, capture some kind of details uh, in this kind of some, uh, complicated reason of these 3D shapes. So those are kind of the advantages. And they can be actually used for any kind of some uh, cases that we are having any arbitrary encoder in the decoder. So this will be the case that basically uh, the encoder can be for anything, or it can be image or this you know, text or some kind of even you know, the 3D things. So this is example that we are taking some partial point cloud as input and producing the 3D shape as the implicit representation. Uh, for those kind of cases, basically we can make some kind of neural net uh, that can basically complete uh, any kind of given the partial 3D information. Right? And also one good thing of like having this kind of architecture is that if we basically encode all these 3D shape into some kind of the latent code, uh, we can typically see some kind of the nice uh, the properties of like having this kind of the smooth interpolation uh, of these 3D shapes. So this is also what we are going to discuss in the, uh, the later the slides. Uh, but typically the neural net is basically learning some kind of the smooth function, which means that if you make some kind of some changes, small changes in the input, uh, then we're gonna also some see some kind of the small changes in the output as well. So it's not basically not basically learning some kind of some uh, function which is kind of like fluctuating. So what we, this basically means that, uh, you know, practically in many kinds of cases, uh, if we make some kind of the encoding and the decoding the architectures, uh, if you basically vary the given the latent code. Uh, so this is basically some of the examples that you're having this shape and this shape. Uh, for those two shapes, we are basically having the two latent codes uh, that are basically uh, given from the, the shape encoder. And if you basically linearly interpolate between these two latent codes uh, and then feeding this kind of the latent, uh, in, the interpolated the latent code into the implicit decoder, then you will also see this kind of the smooth kind of transition of the 3D shapes. Uh, even with the cases that these two shapes are basically having some uh, very different structure and the tuples as well. So these are also kind of good properties that we are having some kind of the uh, smooth interpolation and if you compare this interpolation with like interpolating some of the volume, the occupancies, the voxel, the occupancies, uh, if you basically interpolate each of the, the voxel, the occupancies, uh, then you're gonna see this kind of results that the input shape 
basically disappears and the output shape basically appears over the interpolation. Uh, so this is not the kind of the ideal the interpol interpolation that we want to see. But basically, if we consider basically interpolating the latent force that we have, then we're going to see this kind of some very smooth interpolation between two shapes. Uh, so those are kind of some uh, interesting properties. And basically, this kind of the implicit representation can be used not only for these three shapes, but for the any representation. Uh, so basically, the neural implicit neural representation uh, now is quite famous for the only data about the modalities, like the images and the videos and the audio as well. And this is kind of like one of the examples that you know we are also uh, you know learning the super resolution uh, in terms of the using some kind of the implicit representation. So what we can also do is that given any kind of the low resolution the image and the higher resolution image for those kind of the pairs, uh, we can basically uh, take some kind of the, this low resolution image as the input and basically make some kind of the uh, neural network that predicts the high resolution image as the input representation. So for any kind of the point in the 2D space, uh, we are basically predicting the color information, right? So in this way, we can basically make some kind of the neural net that can do also, also basically, you know, doing some kind of super resolution, increasing the resolution of the input image. And the good thing about like having this kind of architecture is that uh, we can basically choose any arbitrary resolution uh, for the output of the image. So that's kind of the, the advantage of like having the input representation uh, makes sense. Uh, so yeah, in summary, basically the good thing like having the input decoder is that the network can be basically very compact while still basically decoding all, basically encoding and decoding all the fine detailed information. Uh, and we can also basically change the resolution of the output. Uh, and also this architecture can be very flexible in terms of the all the arbitrary the topology of the 3D the shapes. Uh, but the downside is that it basically takes a very long time to basically generate the final the outputs. Basically, we need to uh, you know basically infer the values for each of the points. So that's kind of the pros and the cons of the uh, implicit decoder. Any questions? So if we move on, actually, so this is basically very general the idea for the some implicit decoder. Uh, then let's think about the case that we are having the image as the input. It's basically, uh, uh, no. Uh, specifically, the, let's say the input is the image and the output is the 3D. Uh, so that's basically what we are going to discuss for the also the uh, some of the next the lectures. Uh, for those kind of the cases that we are taking the image as the input and 3D as the output. Now what we can see is that we can make some basically very simple the architecture uh, that is basically taking the image as the input into the, some kind of the image encoder. Uh, taking image as the input, uh, and then 3D as the output, right? And for the this decoder, we can use the you know implicit decoder, right? Uh, it will be doable, right? Uh, then what would be kind of the downside of this? To scale the sorry the network model, how do we scale implicit decoder? I have to train from scratch. Uh, you mean how we train the decoder with some, you know, a set of these three D shapes? Uh, you couldn't get the point. Basically, uh, the question was like, how do we scale the implicit decoder? Have to train from scratch. Make it deeper, for example. Well, I mean, it's just made of the choice of the architecture. Uh, for the if you basically make an MLP architecture for the decoder, you can basically stack more the layers. Yeah, so we didn't discuss any ideas about in terms of how we design the architecture of the neural net. But basically, you know, typically as you have seen in the previous slide, uh, we can make some kind of simple the MLP uh, the architecture with some kind of linear D layers. And it's a matter of like how many layers you stack uh, in the network, right? Makes sense. And let's think about this simple case that we are having some, you know, a simple the MLP here uh, as the decoder and some kind of image encoder here. So basically mapping the image into some kind of the uh, the latent code here, and then basically decoding this latent code into using some kind of the, uh, the input decoder, right? Uh, we are obviously, we train the encoder decoder jointly. Uh, this is exactly the same 
as the, the point net based the autoencoder that you implemented in your same one. But the only thing is that we are just switching the decoding part. Okay. This is exactly the same with the, the, the autoencoder that you implemented, but we are just discussing the idea in terms of how we can switch this decoder into the implicit decoder, right? And here the question is that would it be kind of the best architecture uh, in terms of basically you know, um, mapping the image to 3D? Especially for the case that we are having the image as the input, not text or audio or something else. Uh, in the case that we are having the image as the input, uh, if you basically took the either computer graphics or the computer uh, vision the courses, uh, basically the 2D is basically the output of the rendering of the 3D shapes, right? So if you have any 3D shape in the 3D space, then the image that we get uh, would be basically the output of the like rendering, basically projecting the 3D shape uh, into some 2D plane, right? By the how many people here took the computer graphics course before? Uh, thumb up if you took the computer graphics course. No one took the computer graphics course before. Yes, no. Well, yeah. What well, if you did not take the computer graphics course? I mean, basically, you don't need to have all the knowledge about the computer graphics, but basically, like, you know, all the things that we are basically learning uh, in the computer graphics course is basically how we render the 3D shape into the 2D plane, right? With some kind of the matrix the you know, the multiplication. Uh, but basically the, the idea for that is that we are basically projecting the 3D shape uh, into the you know the 2D plane, right? So which means that uh we, we will be able to have some kind of the some uh some corresponding information between the 3D and the 2D. So what we can see is that each of the points in the 3D space uh will be able to basically project it uh to the 2D point, which means that uh each of the pixel in the input, we will basically contain uh, the information of the, the, the points that are basically the intersection between the array that we are shooting from the 2D plane into the 3D space, right? So here the basic idea is that instead of like just you know, encoding the entire image into a single latent code and decode this back to the 3D shapes, what we can do is that we can basically actually encode the information of each of the pixel here uh, with some kind of the, some fully convolutional neural net uh, that is basically combining also the local and the global information of the input image. So basically what we are going to do is that uh, for each of the pixel, uh, we are getting some kind of the pixel feature, uh, which is basically obtained by basically some kind of the either convolutional neural net where you can use some kind of transformer, right? So basically combining all the global and the local information uh, for this specific point and using this specific point to basically predict the information of the, the points that are on this specific ray. Because we know that these points in this 3D space are basically the points that are basically corresponding to this specific pixel. So we are fully utilizing this kind of some spatial information, like what are these 3D the points that would basically come from the 2D pixel in the image that we have. So that's basically the things that we can make some kind of difference in terms of the, uh, instead of like you know, decoding, sorry, encoding the entire the image into a single latent code and decoding this back to the 3D, we are fully utilizing the correspondence between the 3D points here in the 3D shapes uh, with the 2D pixel in the input image in a way that uh, when you basically predict some kind of the side distance or the some occupancy values for each of the 3D points, uh, we are basically predicting this information not just based on the global information of the input image, but based on the pixel information, uh, which is coming from the as kind of the projection of those 3D points uh, into the 3D, 2D plane, right? What's the difference with the MVCNN? Well, MVCNN was the case that we are just like encoding the multiple images. Here, the question is that given some images, how are we gonna basically decode 3D shapes by utilizing this kind of the 2D to 3D the correspondence information? MVCNN was about the encoding. So this is about decoding. Make sense? 
So that's the basic idea of this kind of the uh, uh, this kind of like the cases like learning the inputs function from the images. So here basically the setup is that we are having either a single or some multiple images as the input. And the output is basically not some kind of some classification score or something, uh, but basically we are basically uh, wanting to basically predict a implicit function that describes a 3D shape. And here basically we are also having the all the camera pose information, like where basically we capture the images and how the 3D shape can be basically project to each of the plane, the, the view plane, right? So given this kind of information, how are we gonna fully utilize this kind of the specialty alignment of the 3D and the 2D uh, is basically the idea in this kind of the cases. So basically these are some of the examples that we are taking these like images as the input and just generating these 3D shapes as the output, right? Uh, so if we move on to, yeah. So for basically the, here the basic idea is that uh, now we are basically fully utilizing the some convolution neural net in terms of like generating uh, the features for each of the pixel. Then for all the points along this ray in this 3D space. So let's say this X is the pixel that we are interested in. Uh, then for all the pixels along this ray, uh, we are taking the X, Y, Z coordinates in this 3D space. And also the feature of this specific D2D to the pixel uh, in terms of predicting either the sign distance function or the occupancy D values. Or in this way, we can predict not only some geometry information, but also some appearance information, like the color information as well. Then in terms of that, we can basically get all the, the geometry information and also the color information to get some of this kind of the colored uh, this really shape as the output. Uh, which typically gives them way better the outputs than just uh, having the you know, simple the encoding decoding architectures uh, because we are utilizing the, the alignment information between the 2D and the 3D. So we are for, to predict uh, the values for each of the 3D point. We are not using the entire, the just like single, uh, the global latent code of the input image, but we are basically using some uh, the uh, information for the this specific pixel, uh, which is the projection of the three D point uh, into this specific two D plane. Does it make sense? Then here the question that we can actually ask might be is that you no. Know, then what's the difference with the depth prediction? Also, there are also kind of the neural network that takes this input image, the color image, as the input and predicting the depths, right? So we can actually consider this as kind of the another kind of way to basically construct some three D information, uh, taking the color image as the input and predicting the depth image as the output. There are already such kind of the neural network uh, predicting, you know, learning the depth information. And what's the difference with this depth prediction in this case? Well, I mean, this is still also the case that we are learning some like some view kind of dependent information, right? So we are basically projecting these three D things into the specific view that we have, and getting some kind of information. So actually, the question is that what's the difference just between the predicting the depths and predicting uh, implicit function in this case? Obviously, we are not only getting the geometry information, but also some color information as well. That can be one difference. Yeah, so basically the major difference is that for the depth prediction, uh, we are only predicting the geometry information of this some visible area from this specific view. So basically depth uh, means the that we are getting the distance uh, to the first intersection points, right? So if you shoot a ray uh, to the 3D object, you're gonna have the, the first intersection point, right? So distance to this, like the first inter in intersection point is the depth information. So predicting depth means that we are only getting information of the visible area from that specific view. But obviously we want to also get the information for the occluded area uh, for the backside of the three objects. So basically beyond the points of the first intersection. Uh, so depth prediction is basically not learning this kind of the full geometry, but only the geometry of the visible area from that specific view. But what we can do in this specific kind of architecture is that we can get 
all the information in even in the occluded area as well in terms of the when you shoot the ray uh, along this ray for all the points in the 3D space uh, you can get the, some the geometry information the assigned distance for the occupancy uh, in a way that when you have some kind of the object here and the other objects here as well you can see that yeah these points are basically uh, you know outside and these points are inside and these points are also outside as well and these points inside as well basically so getting some kind of the all the full 3D shape information including the occluded region as well so that's basically the major difference between the uh, the depth prediction and the 3D the implicit the function prediction in this case. Makes sense. And obviously, even when you also have some multiple images as well, uh, we can also utilize the same architecture in terms of like doing some pooling. So now when you have some multiple views uh, that are basically having some two different pixels, which rays are also intersecting at this specific point, then we can basically take the features from the different pixels and take some kind of the uh, pulling the outputs. We can use the average pulling or whatever the pullings in terms of like aggregating the, the pixel information and do the same thing in terms of predicting sign distance or the occupancy. And let me show some of the outputs here. So as you can see, uh, these are some of the outputs basically taking the images on the left hand side as the input and predicting some of the 3D shapes. Uh, and let me actually show some video as well. Although our approach is trained on a synthetic data set, it's In this, ah, uh, sorry, it's taking some time. Wait, uh, I don't know why this video is not going. But yeah, uh, I, I will send you the link of this video, but you can basically check out the quality of this video here. Uh, so actually it's quite good in terms of, as you can see, even this like the still image, uh, you can see that the output 3D shape is capturing some details in the input 3D shape. But obviously, as you can see here, it's not capturing all the fine details, but still basically getting some kind of the good outputs. So yeah, let me just yeah move on. Yeah, you can check out the link in the Zoom chat. Uh, yeah, okay, so let me move on. Uh, so actually the uh, most important part is here. Uh, so here the thing is that, well, I mean, so given the input decoder, actually we can basically produce some kind of these, you know, some of the, the 3D shape, the outputs. And actually also this input decoder, this idea can be applied to the any data the modalities, also for generating some of the images or the shapes and also the audio video as well. For those kind of the cases, these are some of the outputs that we can get in terms of getting some kind of generating either images, shapes, and the audio. And the thing is that, like compared to some other representation, like having a point cloud or something, uh, this is kind of the good kind of the idea in terms of like that we can capture some details, but still is it is basically failing to capturing some very high frequency, some fine details, as you can see, uh, for some very fine details. Uh, you can see in the image here, actually the output image looks a little bit like blurry, right? And also the outputs of the image is basically not capturing some kind of the fine details, some high frequency details quite well. And here the question is that what's the problem uh, with the architecture that we have? Uh, how can we basically make a neural net that can basically achieve this level of the reconstruction quality? So basically here the idea is that by just making some very small changes in the given the neural net architectures, Actually, we can uh, improve the final the, the generation, the, the quality a lot like this. Basically making all the, uh, you know, capturing all the kind of the details as you can see here. While if you just use some simple, the typical the MLP, then you're gonna get this level of the quality. So here the question is that why we are getting this kind of the low quality in terms of missing some of the high frequency the details and how we can basically improve the architectures in terms of like getting some all the, uh, the details. And this is another example that we are also reconstructing all the 3D things uh, and also images in the 3D 
uh, reconstructing some dragon or some kind of be some medical images uh, for those kind of cases, uh, depending on like on the what, how we basically design the architecture of the neural net of uh, the, the input decoder, uh, we can get uh, very different qualities of the outputs. So here the question is that why we are missing some of the high frequency details uh, in the output function. So in terms of that, you know, when you see the output as kind of a signal, uh, basically having some kind of the some functions, uh, that are basically having some you know having some three D or the two D the outputs. What we can see is that uh, typically for those kind of the cases that we are having some very you know defined details, having some sort of the you know high frequency the details. Uh, those will be the cases that basically if you, uh, so basically input function is a function, right? So if you take uh, the derivatives of this kind of function, uh, for the cases that we are having some you know, fine the details, uh, the first, second, and the higher order the derivatives will not be zero, right? Also the functions, the, the, the derivatives of the functions that we are generating uh, will be some kind of the non-constant functions. Right? But the thing is that, Let's think about the NLP the network with the typical the ReLU activation. So when you basically make some kind of the neural network with the linear layers, the way that we are basically adding some kind of the non-linear uh, would be basically adding the activation function, right? So without the activation function, we are just like stacking some linear layers, right? Which means that the whole the function that we are going to uh, learn would be basically a linear function. While the function that we want to basically learn is a highly nonlinear, basically fluctuating some functions like this. So, so the thing is that you know, the only way that we are adding some kind of the nonlinear V is basically adding the activation function. But the typical the activation function uh, that we are using is basically the ReLU function, right? And what we know about the ReLU function, if you have this background, is that basically this will be the case that we are making uh, the function like this. So the value becomes the so the function becomes linear uh, when the input is the positive, and also it becomes a zero uh, in the negative regions, right? So what we can see is that actually the activation function that we are using is also piecewise linear function, right? Actually, that's kind of the way that we are adding some kind of the non-linearity. Uh, so the, the thing is that the activation function that we are using is basically piecewise linear function, which means that if we take the derivatives of this, like the entire the function, still the, the first derivative will be some kind of a constant, and the second and the higher order the derivatives will be zero function everywhere in the in the, in the the input in the input space. While the function, the input function that we want to predict is the function which the second or the higher order derivatives is not zero. It's basically a very complicated function. So which means that by just taking some linear layers with the level activation, it's impossible to basically produce the function that we want to achieve because the function that we want to get is basically a function uh, which derivatives, the second and the higher order derivatives are basically not zero. And that's kind of almost the same for the other deactivation as well. If we see like, you know, how the other deactivation the functions are introduced, uh, those are kind of like some, some the functions that are quite similar with the ReLU. Uh, which is not kind of like piecewise linear, but, but, but they're basically second and the higher order derivatives also becomes almost zero uh, for most of the, the places, uh, which means that using this kind of the activation function in the linear layers, uh, it's really you know, almost like impossible to basically reconstruct the function, uh, basically having some kind of the high frequency details, uh, which basically second and the higher order derivatives are basically not zero at all uh, for most of the places. So here, the simple idea is that we are basically switching the activation function into the much more the, the complicated function uh, I mean in terms of the shape, uh, not the formulation, uh, like this. Basically, we are taking some kind of the sinusoidal the function as our the activation function. Then the good thing is that we know that for this kind of like sine or the, the cosine the function, uh, the derivatives with any order uh, cannot be zero, right? So which means that when you use this kind of like sinusoidal function as the our the activation the function, then we can still now we can make some kind of the uh, the you know, reconstruct some kind of input function, uh, which basically second or the higher order the derivatives becomes the non-zero the functions. So this is kind of like some examples when you use the you know, sinusoidal function as the activation in the NLP layer. The last column. 
and the other the columns are the cases so like using the other the activation uh the functions in the neural the architectures so first of all we can see that uh the case that we're using these the you know senior so the function as the activation function converges way faster so let me start again so if you see from the very beginning uh yeah from the first few iteration uh the cases that we are using the sinus with the senior so the function application converges way faster while the other cases uh using the other activation the functions are making some kind of blowy the outputs very blowy the outputs and also takes much longer time uh for the convergence yes. And also the good thing is that even from the first few iteration, we are not only reconstructing the given the, the function, input function, but also basically quite precisely reconstructing its derivative as well. So this is the case that we are only basically uh, you know, training the neural net with the ground truth of the pixel values, uh, basically the input function itself, not its uh, the derivatives. But even in the case that when we did not provide any information about the derivatives of the function, uh, we are quite uh, we are getting some you know, quite good the accuracy uh, of the first derivative as well, and also the second derivative as well. So if you compare the first and the second derivatives uh, with the first and the second derivatives of the input here, you can see that actually these two are quite uh, almost the same, even with the the first few iteration. Even in the case that when we did not provide any information from the from the uh the gradients, uh, basically the derivatives of the input the function, so that's kind of a good thing. So which means that, like you know, choosing some right the activation function is really important in terms of like, getting some very uh, high accuracy in the final the outputs. Make sense. Uh, this is is the find the only value for input function? If so, why does it not skill for other the tasks? Actually, yeah, that's that's what we are going to discuss for the next few slides. Uh, this finding is valid for the many other the cases. Uh, but this is especially effective uh, in terms of like learning the input function, especially when the but uh, the the function that we want to learn is kind of some complicated function. But this actually idea uh, can be used. For any other the cases that we want to learn some kind of the complicated function uh, where the uh, the derivatives becomes not zero. So actually what we are going to discuss in the, the later the slides is that actually this idea is kind of like related to the positional encoding that people are using uh, for the transformer. So those are all the kind of the concurrent ideas that basically came up uh, almost at the same time. Uh, but basically, you know, as you can see that the position encoding is used in the many other the places, uh, this is quite you know, generally the idea that can be applied to the many other the tasks. But this idea is, is especially very important uh, in terms of like learning some input function uh, using the neural net. So if I show one more slide here. So even this is the case that we are now trained in neural net by just providing only the uh, you know, gradient information. So now the only information that we are providing is basically the first derivative of the input the function. And then we are predicting a function in a way that the first derivative of the output function becomes the same uh, with the, the given the information of the first derivative of the input function. So even in this case, so what this means is that now we are only providing information of the second row. Uh, the ground truth is given for the second row, basically the first derivative. Uh, and what we can see is that even in the case, we can see that in the first few iteration, you know, the case that we are having the sinusoidal activation function can almost perfectly, you know, uh, reconstruct the input function, even without providing the input function information directly, uh, while the other deactivation uh, cannot basically pr uh, predict the output the function at all, because even they cannot basically uh, predict the further with first derivatives precisely. So that's kind of the, also the case. And as you can see, this will be the case that, you know, we also have seen this kind of case in the previous the lectures, right? Uh, the Poisson equation uh, was the case that we are reconstructing the input function uh, only from the derivatives. And this is basically the case that we are solving some kind of the Poisson equation using the neural net. So the question is that basically when we provide only the first derivative information to the neural net, 
whether the neural net will be able to basically find the solution of the basic function, uh, which derivatives becomes the same with the derivatives that we are providing. Uh, for those kind of cases, if you basically use the other deactivation the function, uh, it will be really difficult to find the solution. Uh, while when the uh, when you basically use the sinusoidal the function as the activation the function, uh, because it can uh, basically learn all these kind of the high frequency details uh, very quickly, uh, we can also get some kind of the results. So like reconstructing the full input the, the function. So that's very clearly very interesting the results. And also the same idea, like reconstructing 3D shape as well. Uh, so Sorry. Please. A single fully connected siren with five layers and 1,024 hidden units may also faithfully represent a full scale room, while a RELU network fails to faithfully reconstruct the room, as illustrated by the inability to fit the curtains, the bowl on the table, or the feet of the sofas. Yeah, so as you can see here, compared to the case that you're using the RELU function as the activation, when you use the you know uh, the siren, basically the sinus so it will be function as the activation, you can get way better quality in terms of getting all the fine details of the geometry. Uh, so, so that's the basic idea. Uh, so since we are uh, running out of time, let's continue discuss this uh, the activation the function in the next time, and after that we are going to move on to the neural rendering. Uh, any other questions? Any questions? Maybe to this lecture. Okay, uh, let's stop here and let's continue on Wednesday. Thank you.